The Campaign at Lariba. First Stages. During the time that I had been occupied with these affairs, I instructed another of my generals, Gaius Fabius, to go on ahead to Spain with three legions which had been in winter camps at Narbonne or nearby. He was to lose no time in seizing the passes over the Pyrenees, which were then held by units from the army of Pompey's general, Lucius Afranius. I ordered the other legions, whose winter quarters were farther away, to follow Fabius and join up with him. Fabius acted as he had been instructed. Making good speed, he drove the outposts from the pass and went on by forced marches till he made contact with Afranius's main army. It will be remembered that Pompey had sent Lucius Vibullius Rufus to Spain. When he arrived, he found the country in the control of Pompey's three generals, Afranius, Petraeus, and Varro. Afranius held eastern Spain with three legions, while in western Spain, Varro, with two legions, held the areas between the Sierra de Segura and the Guadiana and Petraeus, also with two legions, held Lusitania and the country between the Guadiana and the Duoro. The plan of action which they now made was as follows. Petraeus, with the whole army, was to march out of Lusitania by way of the Vaternes and join up with Afrenius, while Varro, with his two legions, was to look after the whole of western Spain. Once they had agreed upon this plan, Petraeus ordered all the states of Lusitania to supply him with cavalry and auxiliary troops, and Afranius sent out the same orders to the peoples of Castile and the Asturias, and the semi-civilized tribes along the north coast. As soon as these troops were mobilized, Petraeus marched through the Vetones and joined Afranius. They both agreed to base themselves on Lerida a place with outstanding strategic advantages. Afranius, as has been already stated, had three legions, and Petraeus two. They had also about eighty cohorts of auxiliaries, those from the east armed with long wooden shields, and those from the west with light round ones of leather, and about five thousand cavalry from both districts together. I, on my side, had sent ahead of me into Spain six legions, five thousand auxiliary infantry, and three thousand cavalry, which had served with me throughout the wars in Gaul. I had also raised from the Gallic province, which I had myself conquered, another three thousand cavalry, by calling up individually from each state the best and bravest types of men. Those of the highest quality came from Aquitania, and from the mountain tribes on the Spanish border. I had heard that Pompey, with his legions, was marching through Mauritania on his way to Spain, and would soon be arriving there. At this juncture, I borrowed money from the officers and centurions and distributed it among the soldiers. I thus killed two birds with one stone, binding the centurions to me because I owed them money, and the soldiers because I had given it to them. Meanwhile, Fabius was sending out letters and personal agents in an attempt to win over to our side the tribes in the neighborhood of Lerida. He had built two bridges, four miles apart, over the Segre, and was sending troops across the river to bring in supplies, since in the previous days he had used up what was available on his own side of the river. Pompey's generals were doing the same thing for the same reason, and there were frequent engagements between the cavalry on each side. Fabius always sent two legions out to protect the foragers, and on one occasion, when the legions had already crossed by the lower bridge, with the transport and cavalry following behind, the bridge suddenly collapsed because of a high wind and an unusual volume of water, with the result that most of the cavalry were left stranded on the nearer bank. Seeing the timber and hurdles which were carried downstream, Petraeus and Afranius realized what had happened, and Afranius acted at once. Across his own bridge, which was built to connect his camp with the city of Lerida, he sent out four legions and the whole of his cavalry to engage Fabius's two legions. These were under the command of Lucius Plancus, who, when he found that the enemy was approaching, took up an emergency position on higher ground and formed his men in a double line facing in both directions, so as to avoid being attacked in the rear by the cavalry. In this way, though he was heavily outnumbered, 
he was able to stand up to resolute attacks made on him by both Afranius' cavalry and his infantry. Fighting was still going on between the cavalry forces when both sides saw in the distance the standards of two legions. These legions had been sent by Fabius by way of the farther bridge to come to the relief of our men, since he had correctly guessed that the enemy commanders would make use of the chance that had come their way and would try to overwhelm them. As the legions approached, the battle was broken off and both sides withdrew to their camps. Two days afterward, I arrived myself with nine hundred cavalry, which I had kept as an escort. Repairs on the bridge that had broken down in the storm were nearly finished, and I ordered the last part of the work to be done by night. Next day, after making myself acquainted with the lay of the land, I left six cohorts to guard the bridge, the camp, and our heavy equipment, and marched with the whole army in three columns to Lerida. We halted close to Afranius's camp and waited there for some time under arms, giving him an opportunity of fighting on level ground. Challenged in this way, Afranius led out his troops and formed them up halfway down the hill on which his camp was placed. When I realized that it was his decision not to fight a pitched battle, I decided to build a camp of my own about four hundred yards from the foot of the hill. I did not want my men while they were on the job to be frightened by sudden enemy attacks and prevented from working. So I told them not to build a rampart, which, because of its height, would obviously be visible from a distance. Instead, they were to dig a fifteen-foot trench along the side facing the enemy. The first and second lines stayed in battle order as they were, and behind them, invisible to the enemy, the third line did the digging. In this way the whole thing was completed before Afranius could know that we were fortifying the position at all. In the evening I withdrew the legions behind the trench and gave them a night's rest, though they were still under arms. Next day I kept the whole army inside the shelter of the trench. Since it was necessary to go some way to find material for a rampart, I adopted for the moment the same method as that of the previous day, and ordered three more trenches of the same size as the first one to be dug, so as to enclose the whole camp. On each of these trenches one legion was occupied, while the other legions were drawn up in battle order to face the enemy. Afranius and Petraeus, wishing to cause terror among our men and stop their work, led their troops down to the bottom of the hill and made some moves against us. However, I felt that I could rely on the three legions which were on guard, and on the protection of the original trench, so the enemy's action caused no interruption in the work. In fact, they did not advance far from the foot of the hill, and before long retired to their camp. On the third day, I had a rampart built all around the camp, and ordered the cohorts, which had been left in the other camp with the equipment, to come and join us. Between Lerida and the hill on which Petraeus and Afranius were encamped, there was a stretch of level ground of about eight hundred yards with a small hillock, more or less in the middle. I believed that if I could seize and fortify this hillock, I should be able to cut the enemy off from their bridge and Lerida, and from all the supplies which they had brought into the town. Hoping to do just this, I led three legions out of camp, drew them up in line in what seemed a good position, and ordered the shock troops of one legion to go forward at the double and seize the hillock. Afranius, however, saw what we were doing. He had some cohorts on guard duty in front of his camp, and he sent them by a shorter route to occupy the position we were aiming at. There was some fighting, but as Afranius's men had reached the mound first, our men were driven back, and then, as more enemy reinforcements appeared, were forced to turn and retreat to the main body of the army. These soldiers of Afranius had their own methods of fighting. They would charge forward at full speed, showing great daring in reaching their objective. They did not bother much about keeping in regular order, but would fight as individuals or in small groups, and if hard-pressed, they were not ashamed to fall back again and abandon the ground they had won. This can be described as a native style of fighting, and they had got used to it in the course of their constant engagement with the Lusitanians,
and other native tribes. In fact, it is usually the case that when an army has had a long period of foreign service, it becomes much influenced by the methods of the country where it is operating. My men, on the other hand, had had no experience of this sort of fighting and were considerably disturbed by it. They had been trained always to keep in their proper formations under their own standards, and not to yield a position which they had taken up unless there was some very good reason for doing so. Now, these sudden individual attacks made them think that they were being outflanked. And so, when the assault troops had been driven back, the legion on that wing abandoned its position and retreated to the nearest hill. I found that panic was spreading along almost the whole line, a state of affairs which I had never expected, and to which I was quite unused. Shouting out to the men to stand firm, I brought up the Ninth Legion in support. The enemy had shown a kind of insolent daring in their pursuit, and I put a stop to this. I forced them to turn back and retreat to Lerida, where they formed up outside the walls. But the men of the Ninth, who were full of enthusiasm and determined to make up for the setback we had received, pressed their pursuit rashly and too far. They advanced right up to the hill on which Lerida stands, and here found themselves in a difficult position. They tried to withdraw, but it was now the turn of the enemy who charged down on our men from higher ground. There were steep, rocky gorges on each side of them, and the space between was only wide enough for three cohorts to be drawn up in line. Thus it was impossible to give them support on their flanks, or to use cavalry to help them when they were in trouble. From the town, however, the ground sloped down gently for about five hundred yards. Our men, whose enthusiasm had unwisely carried them so far, stood facing this slope, fighting in a most unfavorable position. They had no room to maneuver, and because they had halted at the very foot of the high ground, every weapon directed at them found its mark. Nevertheless, they stood their ground, fighting magnificently in spite of heavy casualties. Meanwhile, the enemy's strength was increasing. From their camp, new cohorts were constantly being sent through the town into the fighting line so that fresh troops could relieve those who were tired. I was obliged to do the same thing, and sent up other cohorts to take the places of my own exhausted men. The fighting went on without a break for five hours, our men being in constant difficulties and heavily outnumbered. They had now used up all their ammunition, and drawing their swords, they charged up the hill against the cohorts in front of them. Some they cut to pieces, others they forced to turn and run. So were the enemy cohorts pushed back against the wall, or hurrying in terror into the town, our men could retreat without difficulty. The withdrawal was made all the easier and safer by our cavalry, who, though posted on much lower ground, very bravely managed to struggle up on both sides to the top of the ridge, and then rode up and down between the two lines. The fighting had gone first one way, and then the other. In the first encounter we lost about seventy killed, and had about six hundred wounded. Among the killed was Quintus Fulginius, who, because of his outstanding courage, had risen from the lower ranks to become a leading centurion of the Fourteenth Legion. Afranius lost more than two hundred men killed, among whom was one of his senior centurions, Titus Caecilius, and four other centurions as well. In fact, each side thought that it had come off best in the day's fighting. Afranius's troops had been generally considered inferior to mine, yet they had stood their ground in close fighting, and resisted our attacks for a long time. At the beginning of the action they had held the hillock, which had been our original objective, and in the first engagement had forced us to retreat. On the other hand, our men could claim that they had fought for five hours against superior numbers, and with the advantage of the ground against them, too, that they had forced their way up the hill, armed only with their swords, that they had made the enemy leave his higher position and drive him back into the town. The enemy now built strong defense works around the hillock, for which the fighting had taken place, and manned them with a garrison, 
We also suffered an unforeseen misfortune within two days from the time of the battle. There was a tremendous storm which brought with it more rainfall than had ever been known in these parts. At the same time, the snows were washed down from the mountains, so that the river overflowed its banks, and in one day both of the bridges that Babius had built were swept away. The result was that we were placed in a very difficult position. As has already been explained, our camp was between the two rivers, Segre and Tsinka, which were about thirty miles apart. Neither of these rivers could be crossed, and so we were forced to remain in this confined space. The states which were on friendly terms with us were unable to send us grain. Some of our own people, who had gone out for quite a distance to bring in supplies, were cut off by the floods and could not get back. And the large convoys of provisions coming from Italy and Gaul could not reach the camp. It was also the worst possible time of the year. There was no grain left in the winter stocks, and the new harvest was not quite ripe. The neighboring tribes had been drained of supplies, since Ephraimius had had nearly all the grain taken to Lerida before I arrived, and what little was left had been used up by us in the last few days. Meat might have been a possible substitute for the grain which we lacked, but we could not even get meat because the people of the neighborhood had driven off their cattle as soon as the war began. And those of our men who went out to look for fodder and grain were attacked by Lusitanian light infantry and Spanish targeteers, who knew the country well and had no difficulty in crossing the rivers, since they regularly carried with them on active service bladders, which could be used as floats. Aphranius's men, on the other hand, had everything they needed. There were already large stocks of grain which had been collected previously, and more were coming in from all parts of the province. There was also plenty of food for the animals. Since they held the bridge at Lerida, they could bring in their supplies perfectly safely and could cross the river into country that had hitherto been untouched and from which I was entirely cut off. The floods lasted for several days. We tried to repair the bridges, but were hindered both by the strength of the current and by enemy troops stationed along the bank, who prevented the work being done. This was easy enough for them to do. The banks were steep, and the river flowed fast. Moreover, their troops, strung out all along the bank, could concentrate their fire on the small, cramped area where our men were working. It was a hard job to build a bridge against a great flood of water, and at the same time to be trying to keep out of the way of enemy weapons. Meanwhile, Afranius was informed that large convoys on their way to us had halted at the river. There were archers from the Rutene, cavalry from Gaul, and great numbers of wagons, all heavily loaded in the usual Gallic way. There were also about six thousand civilians, people of every description, with their slaves and children. There was no fixed order on the march, and no one was in supreme command. Everyone did as he liked, and they all traveled without any apprehension of danger, assuming the immunity to which they had been used on previous occasions. Among them were some young men of good families from Rome, sons of senators and of gentlemen, also deputations from a number of states and officers of my own returning from various missions. The whole lot of them were held up by the river, and Ephraimius decided to get them into his power. He sent out at night with his entire cavalry force and three legions, and launched a cavalry attack on them before they realized what was happening. Nevertheless, the Gallic cavalry were soon ready for action and joined battle. Few as they were, they held their own against great numbers of the enemy, so long as the fighting was confined to cavalry. But when the standards of the legions were seen to be approaching, they retired to the nearest high ground, leaving a few dead. But the fact that the battle lasted for as long as it did had an important bearing on the security of our people, since it gave them time to withdraw to higher ground. Our losses on that day were about two hundred archers, a few cavalry, a few camp servants, and a small amount of the luggage. As the result of all this, however, the price of grain rose sharply, as indeed usually happens not only when there is a real shortage, but also when people think that there will be one. Already the price of grain was about fifty denarii a peck, 
Lack of food was affecting the soldiers' health, and things were getting worse with every day that passed. Within a few days, the situation had completely changed. Fortune had swung the other way, and while we were struggling with shortages of all kinds, the enemy had everything they wanted and appeared to be in a much stronger position. There was simply not enough grain to be had from the Spanish tribes that had come over to my side. So I asked them for livestock and sent out foragers even farther afield than before, doing everything I could to relieve the pressing needs of the moment. In their letters to Rome, Afranius, Petraeus, and their friends gave an even fuller and more glorified account of the situation than was justified by the facts. Rumor added to the story, and people began to think that the war was practically over. As the letters and messengers arrived in Rome, crowds of people gathered outside Afranius's house by way of offering their hearty congratulations. There were many who now left Italy to join Pompey, some because they wanted to be the first to tell him the good news, others to avoid giving the impression that they had been waiting to see how the war would end and had consequently arrived last in the queue. As for us, we were certainly in a difficult position. Afranius's troops and cavalry were in control of all the roads, and we were unable to repair the bridges. What I did was to instruct the troops to build some boats, like the ones I had seen some time ago when I was campaigning in Britain. The keels and the basic structure were made of light wood, and the rest was of wicker work covered with hides. When they were finished, each one was loaded onto a couple of wagons, and they were then all taken down by night to the river, which was about twenty-one miles from the camp. I got some troops across the river in these boats and occupied a hill near the bank without being observed. We hurriedly fortified the position and finished the fortifications before the enemy knew anything about it. Later, I brought a whole legion across, and we started from both banks to build a bridge, finishing the job in two days. It was now possible for the convoys and those of our own men who had gone far afield for food to rejoin us safely, and I could also take measures to improve the general position with regard to supplies. On the same day, I brought most of the cavalry across the river. Some enemy foragers who had no apprehension of danger and had scattered in all directions were caught off their guard and attacked by our cavalry, who took a number of prisoners and captured a lot of animals. Some cohorts of Spanish targeteers were sent out in support, but our men did the right thing by forming up in two bodies, one to guard the booty, the other to resist and drive off the oncoming cohorts. One enemy cohort, which had unwisely got out of position by charging ahead of the rest, was cut off, surrounded, and annihilated. Our cavalry got back safely to camp by the bridge, bringing a lot of booty with them. Naval Battle at Marseille While these operations were going on near Lerida, the people of Marseille, on the advice of Domitius, had got seventeen warships ready for service, eleven of which were decked. They brought into service also a quantity of smaller craft, with the idea of frightening our fleet by sheer weight of numbers. They put on board these ships a large number of archers and of those Albician troops mentioned earlier, encouraging them with high pay and promises of more to come. Domitius insisted on having some ships placed under his personal command and manned them with his own retainers and herdsmen, whom he had brought out with him. There was, in fact, nothing lacking in their preparations. They were full of confidence as they sailed out against our ships, which under the command of Decimus Brutus were stationed off the island that lies opposite Marseille. So far as ships went, Brutus was heavily outnumbered, but I had left with him to man his fleet some of the best fighting material to be found in the legions, shock troops and centurions who had volunteered for this service. They had got ready grappling irons and harpoons, and had equipped themselves with large quantities of pikes, javelins, and other weapons. When they saw that the enemy was coming, they sailed out of port and joined battle. Both sides fought with the greatest courage and spirit. <laughs> 
Indeed, the Albicians, a race of tough mountaineers and well accustomed to warfare, showed soldierly qualities that were scarcely inferior to those of our own men. Having only just left the city, they remembered what the people of Marseille had just promised them, and the herdsmen of Domitius too, who had been encouraged to fight by the prospect of gaining their freedom, were eager to show what they could do under their master's eyes. The Massilians could rely on fast sailing vessels and well-trained pilots. They avoided or parried our men's attacks, and so long as they were allowed space in which to maneuver, they tried to extend their line beyond ours so as to outflank us, to bring several of their own ships against single ships of ours, or to sweep up alongside with the aim of snapping off all our oars. But when they were forced to come to close quarters, they relied not so much on the skill and clever maneuvering of their pilots as on the courage of the mountaineers whom they had on board. Our own ships were manned by less experienced crews and by less skillful pilots, men who had just been taken into service from merchant ships and still did not know the technical terms in use on warships. We were hampered, too, by the slowness and heaviness of our ships, which had been hurriedly constructed from green timber and were not as fast as they might have been. So whenever there was a chance of fighting at close quarters, any one of our ships was ready enough to close with two of the enemy. Grappling irons were thrown out, and when the enemy were held fast, our men, fighting at both sides of their ship, would board the enemy vessels. They killed great numbers of the Albicians and of Domitius's herdsmen, sank some ships, captured others with their crews, and drove the rest back into the harbor. On that day, the Massilians lost nine ships including those that were captured. The Campaign at Lerida. Second Phase. I heard of the naval battle at Marseille when I was at Lerida. Our bridge here was now finished, and things began rapidly to go better for us. Our cavalry were very active, and the enemy became terrified of them. The enemy's liberty and confidence in moving about was now much restricted. Either they did not venture far from their camp so as to be able to get back there quickly, and consequently did not cover much ground in their foraging, or to avoid our scouts and cavalry detachments, they went out on long, circuitous routes, and, if they suffered any setback at all, or even caught sight of our cavalry in the distance, they would break order, drop whatever they were carrying, and run away. Finally, they got into the habit of going for days on end without doing anything, and adopted the unusual procedure of foraging by night. Meanwhile, the Oskenses and Kalaguratani, their dependents, sent deputations to me to say that they would obey my orders. Their example was followed by representatives from Tarragona, from the Jagatani and Ausitani, and a few days later from the Ilurgavonenses, who live on the lower Ebro. I asked them all to send grain. This they promised to do, and getting together all the baggage animals they could find, they brought it into camp. A cohort of Ilurgavonenses left their post and came over to us when they heard what their government had decided. Everything had changed, and had changed quickly. The bridge was finished. Five important states had joined us. Our supplies were assured. There was shown to be no truth in the rumors about Pompey marching through Africa with reinforcements for his legions, and now a number of the more remote tribes severed their relations with Afranius and came over to us. All this had a very depressing effect on the enemy's morale. Meanwhile, I took steps to avoid having always to send the cavalry around on a long detour by the bridge. After choosing a suitable place for the operation, we started to dig a number of trenches, thirty feet wide, so as to drain off into them part of the river Segre and make it fordable. By the time that we had nearly finished them, Afranius and Petraeus had become really frightened. They knew how strong we were in cavalry, and dreaded the prospect of being entirely cut off from food and fodder. So they decided to leave their present position, and to fight the next campaign in Aragon.
In making this decision, they were also influenced by the fact that in this area, the native states had, in the previous war, either been on the side of Sertorius or had remained loyal to Rome. The former ones had been conquered by Pompey and still feared his name and power, even in his absence. The latter had been well treated by him and were bound to him by affection, while my name among these native tribes was comparatively unknown. In these parts they counted on being able to raise large forces of cavalry and supporting troops, and proposed to protract the campaign into the winter on ground of their own choosing. After deciding on this plan, they ordered all ships on the Ebro to come together at Mekinenza, which was nearly thirty miles from their camp. Here they ordered a bridge of boats to be made. They then took two legions across the Segre and built a camp with a rampart twelve feet high. I was informed by our scouts of what was going on, and now our soldiers put everything they could into the work, which went on day and night of diverting the river. We had got to the point where the cavalry, though it was a difficult enough proceeding, were nevertheless able to venture across the river, though the infantry were prevented from crossing both by the speed of the current and by the depth of the water, which came right up to their armpits. However, we were finding a way across the Segre, and this happened at almost exactly the same time as I received news that the bridge over the Ebro was nearly finished. The enemy now came to the conclusion that it was all the more important for them to be moving. Leaving two auxiliary cohorts to hold Lerida, they crossed the Segre with all the rest of their forces and rejoined the two legions which had already crossed some days earlier. There was nothing that I could do except to harass the enemy's marching column with my cavalry and do it what damage I could, since if I were to use my own bridge for the legions, that would involve a long roundabout route, while the enemy would have a much shorter distance to go to reach the Ebro. So I sent out the cavalry. They forded the river and suddenly appeared in the rear of Aphrenius' column, which had left camp soon after midnight. Our men were in great force, and they swarmed round the enemy flanks, holding up the march and trying to force a halt. At dawn, the sentries posted on high ground near our camp could see the enemy's rear guard being very roughly handled by our cavalry. There were times when the end of the column was forced to halt, and was even cut off from the rest. Then the enemy's cohorts would charge all together and drive our men back, and then again our men would wheel around and make another attack. Now, all over our camp, the soldiers were gathering in groups and complaining among themselves that the enemy were being allowed to slip out of their grasp, and consequently the war was being dragged on unnecessarily. They approached the centurions and senior officers, begging them to let me know that I was not to think twice about exposing them to any difficulty or danger. They were ready for anything, they said. They had both the ability and the courage to cross the river where the cavalry had crossed it. I was certainly impressed by what they said, and by the spirit which they showed. And though I had my doubts about exposing my army to so violent a flow of water, nevertheless I thought that the venture was worth taking and ought to be attempted. So I ordered the soldiers who were not of the first quality, men who did not seem to have the courage or the strength for the undertaking, to be withdrawn from their companies and left them with a full legion to guard the camp. I led out the other legions, each man carrying the minimum of equipment, and after stationing large numbers of pack animals in the river above and below the ford, we started to make the crossing. The force of the current swept a few of the soldiers off their feet, but they were picked up and helped across by some of our cavalry, and not a single man was lost. As soon as they were all safely across, I saw that they were formed up in their proper units and led them forward, marching in three columns. The men showed such keenness that, although they had gone six miles farther around and had had a long delay at the ford, it was only about 2.30 p.m. when they caught up with the enemy, who had started about midnight. Aphranius, who was in company with Petraeus, saw us coming in the distance, and was both surprised and alarmed by what he saw. He halted and formed his army up in battle order on some rising ground. I had no wish to throw my troops into battle when they were tired, and so I rested them in the fields nearby. When Aphrenius tried to go forward again, we followed him up and impeded his march. As a result, the enemy were forced to pitch camp earlier than they had intended, 
There were hills nearby, and five miles ahead the routes into the hills became narrow and difficult. What the enemy wanted was to get into the shelter of these hills, so as to be safe from our cavalry, and then to leave covering detachments in the narrow passes, which would hold up our army's advance while they themselves crossed the Abro without any danger or anxiety. They should have done everything possible to achieve this object, but they were tired after a troublesome march and a whole day's fighting. So they put off their plan until the next day. I also camped on a hill nearby. About midnight, our cavalry brought in some of the enemy who had gone rather too far from their camp to get water. I was informed by them that the enemy commanders were quietly leading their forces out of camp. As soon as I knew this, I ordered the signal to be given, the usual army order to pack up before moving, and when the enemy heard the shouting, they cancelled their departure and kept their troops inside the camp, being frightened of having to fight by night when they were loaded with their equipment, or else of being held up by our cavalry in the narrow passes. Next day, Petraeus went quietly out of camp with a few horsemen to reconnoiter. We did the same thing. I sent out from my camp Lucius Decidius Saxa, with a small detachment, to see what the country was like. Each party brought back the same report. There were about five miles of level country ahead, and after that the route became rough and mountainous. Whoever managed first to occupy this narrow part of the road would have no difficulty in preventing the other side from getting through. Petraeus and Afranius held a council of war at which they discussed the question of when to depart. The majority were in favor of leaving by night, with the idea of reaching the narrow part of the road before it became known that they were on the move. Others, remembering that on the previous night the alarm had been sounded in our camp, regarded this as a proof that it would be impossible to get away without being noticed. Large numbers of our cavalry, they said, were on duty by night, and would be patrolling the whole country and watching every road. Then, too, battles at night ought to be avoided because, in civil wars, if the soldiers begin to lose confidence, they are apt to think more of their own fears than of the duty they owe to their generals, whereas in daytime they are ashamed to appear cowardly when their comrades are looking on, and are also affected by the presence of their officers and centurions, all known factors in preserving good order and discipline in an army. There was therefore every reason for trying to break through by day. Even if they suffered some losses, it was still possible to reach their objective with the army still intact as a fighting force. It was this view that prevailed at the Council of War, and it was decided to start next day at dawn. After reconnoitering the district, as soon as the first signs of light appeared in the sky, I led out all my forces from camp. We were to go by a long roundabout way, with no clearly marked route, since the roads to Mekinenza and the Abro were blocked by the enemy's camp. We had wide valleys to cross where the going was very difficult. Often we were held up by steep cliffs, which meant passing the equipment up from hand to hand, and then one man helping the next on the ascent, so that they had to go unarmed for quite long distances. But no one objected to facing all these hardships. They thought that all their labors would be over if they could only cut the enemy off from the Abro and from his supplies. At the beginning of our march, the soldiers of Afranius ran out of their camp in high spirits to see the sight, and followed us on our way with insulting language. In their opinion, we were short of food, and were therefore being compelled to retire and fall back on Lerida. And in fact, our route was different from the one which we would have taken if we could. It appeared indeed to lead in the opposite direction— the enemy commanders congratulated themselves on having decided to stay in camp, and their opinion about our condition seemed to be confirmed by the fact that they could see us marching without baggage animals or heavy equipment, so they felt sure that we could not hold out much longer against hunger. But when they saw that our column was gradually wheeling to the right, and then that our vanguard was already getting past the line of their camp, there was not a man among them so stupid or so lazy as not to realize that they must leave camp immediately and try to get ahead of us. The fall-in was sounded. A few cohorts were left to guard the camp, while the rest marched out and took the direct road to the Abro.
Everything now depended on speed, the question being which side could first occupy the passes into the mountains. My own army was slowed down by the difficulties of the route, but on the other hand, Afranius's men were held up by our cavalry, which hung on close to them. Afranius also had got himself into an awkward situation from which there was no way out. Even if he did get first to the high ground, which was his objective, and so secure the safety of his army, he would still have to abandon all baggage and equipment and the cohorts which had been left behind in camp. These were now cut off by my army and could not possibly be relieved. As it was, we reached the mountains first. After crossing over some great rocks, I found a stretch of level ground where I drew up my army facing the enemy. Afranius, with his rear guard still harassed by our cavalry and with our main force in front of him, occupied some high ground and there halted. From this position he sent out four cohorts of targeteers toward the highest mountain in sight with orders to hurry there at the double and occupy it. He intended to follow after them with his whole army and to go on from there to Mekinenza by another route along the mountain ridges. The targeteers, cutting across country from his main army, were on their way to this mountain when they were observed and charged by our cavalry. They put up no sort of resistance and were surrounded and killed in sight of both armies. Victory was now in my grasp. I was perfectly well aware that no army, demoralized as it had been by watching such a reverse, could hold out long, especially if it were forced to fight on level and open ground, surrounded on all sides by cavalry. And indeed... I was being urged by everyone to bring on just such an action. Centurions and officers of all ranks came crowding around me, all telling me not to hesitate about joining battle. Every man in our army, they said, was ready and eager for battle, whereas Afranius' men had shown clearly enough that they were frightened. They had failed to go to the rescue of their own men. They showed no signs of coming down from the hill. They were not standing up well to attacks made on them by our cavalry, and all crowded together with their standards in one place, they were losing formation and failing to preserve their ranks in proper order. If, so I was told, I was frightened of attacking uphill, there was sure to be a chance of engaging somewhere else, since Afranius would have to come down into the plain and could not remain where he was forever without water. However, now that I had cut the enemy off from his supplies, I hoped to be able to finish the whole thing off without having to fight, or to expose my own men to danger. Why should I lose any of my own men, even in a victory? Why let them be wounded when they had served me so well? And why tempt fortune? After all, a good general should win victories by intelligence, just as much as by brute force. Then, too, I felt compassion for men who were my fellow countrymen, and who would certainly be killed if there were a battle. I preferred to gain my object without causing them any loss of life or limb. These views of mine, however, were not generally approved. In fact, the soldiers went about openly saying that because such a good chance of victory was being thrown away, they would refuse to fight next time I asked them to. Nevertheless, I did not alter my point of view. I withdrew a little from my position, so as to give the enemy more confidence, and Petraeus and Afranius, now they had the chance of doing so, retired to their camp. We camped as near to them as possible, after having posted detachments in the hills and blocked all roads to the Ebro. On the following day, the enemy commanders, alarmed by the fact that they had no prospects either of reaching the Ebro or of getting supplies, debated what they should do next. There were two possible routes, one to Lerida, if they wished to retreat, the other to Tarragona, if they decided to move in that direction. While they were in the middle of their discussions, they were informed that their water carriers were being attacked by our cavalry. This news led them to station outposts of cavalry and auxiliary troops with regular legionary cohorts in between, at frequent intervals along the way, and to set about building a rampart from their camp to the water.
so that they would in future be able to bring the water inside their fortifications without anxiety and without having to use these outposts. Petraeus and Aphranius both took a hand in organizing this work and went personally some distance beyond the camp in order to see that it was being done properly. Once they had gone, their soldiers had an opportunity to speak freely with mine. They came out in numbers, inquiring for friends or fellow townsmen in our camp and asking to see them. Thus they thanked us all together for having spared them on the previous day. They would not be alive now, they said, if it had not been for our kindness. They then inquired about me, whether I could be trusted and whether they could honorably surrender, saying that they wished they had done so in the first place instead of fighting against their own friends and relations. What they heard reassured them, and they demanded that I should promise to spare the lives of Petraeus and Ephranius, since they did not want it to look as though they had been engaged in any underhanded work, or were betraying their own people. When I gave the required guarantees, they promised to come over to us at once, and sent some senior centurions to me to discuss the terms of the surrender. Meanwhile, my men were asking their friends on the other side to come over into our camp to be entertained, or else were being themselves invited into their camp, so that it seemed that there was only one camp where there had been two before. Several high-ranking officers and centurions came to call on me and to establish friendly relations. So did a number of Spanish chieftains, whom the enemy had called up as allies and then kept in their camp as hostages. They now tried to find friends or acquaintances in my army who would be ready to introduce them to me. Even Aphranius' young son made approaches to me through Sulpicius, one of my staff officers, asking me to spare his and his father's life. Indeed, it was a general scene of happiness and thanksgiving. Aphranius's men were delighted at the thought of having escaped from a most dangerous position, and our men were equally delighted because it looked as though they had won a great victory without any bloodshed at all. Everyone agreed that I was reaping a handsome profit from my well-known reluctance to carry matters to extremes. And now, the decision that I had previously made was generally considered to have been correct. When the news of what was happening was brought to Aphranius, he left the work on which he was engaged and returned to camp, apparently quite ready to accept quietly and with a good grace whatever situation he might find. Petraeus, however, kept his original spirit and resolution. He armed his servants, and with them and his official bodyguard of Spanish targeteers and a few native cavalry, Retainers of his, whom he kept about his person, he suddenly rode up to the rampart. Once inside the camp, he put a stop to all fraternization, killed any of our men whom he could lay his hands on, and drove the rest out. These latter were frightened enough at finding themselves suddenly in danger, but they formed up into a body, and, wrapping their left arms in their cloaks, drew their swords, and so beat off the attacks of the targeteers and cavalry. The fact that their camp was close by gave them confidence, and they got back there safely under the protection of the cohorts on guard at the gates. After having achieved this result, Petraeus, with tears in his eyes, went from company to company, appealing to the soldiers and begging them not to betray him and not to betray their general, Pompey, to the vengeance of an enemy. A crowd quickly gathered outside his headquarters. He then demanded that they should all swear an oath that they would not desert or betray the army or its commanders, and would not take any separate measures for securing their own safety apart from that of the rest. Petraeus was the first to take the oath, and Aphranius was compelled to take the same oath after him. Then came the officers and centurions, and then the men came forward by companies and took the oath. Two. It was then proclaimed that anyone who was harboring any soldier of mine should bring him forward. Some were brought forward and put to death publicly in front of headquarters, but most were hidden by those who had invited them and were allowed to escape across the rampart during the night. So the terrorism employed by the enemy generals, the savagery of their punishments, and the new obligations of the oath which had been sworn 
removed for the moment all hope of a surrender. The feelings of the soldiers reverted to what they had been, and there was hostility on both sides as before. I ordered a careful search to be made for those enemy soldiers who had come into our camp during the period of fraternization, and had them sent back to their own camp. But there were several officers and tribunes who decided that they wanted to stay with me. Later on, I saw that all of these got promotion. The centurions were restored to their former rank, and the officers also received the same posts as they had held previously. The Campaign at the Reader Final Victory Afranius' troops were now finding it difficult to get water, and almost impossible to go out foraging. The men and the legions had a certain amount of grain, since they had been ordered to bring with them from Lerida rations for twenty-two days. But the Spanish targeteers and auxiliary troops had none, nor had they much chance of finding any, and physically they were quite unused to carrying heavy loads. Consequently, large numbers of them deserted and came over to us every day. The enemy were therefore in a very awkward position. Of the two proposed plans, the simplest seemed to be to return to Lerida, where they had a small stock of grain in reserve. Once in Lerida, they felt, they would be less hampered in planning for the future. Tarragona was a long way off, and they realized that on the journey there, quite a number of things might go wrong with them. So they decided on the first plan, and at once left their camp. I sent forward the cavalry to attack them in the rear, and slow up their march, and followed after them with the legions. Their rear guard was given no rest, and was constantly in action with our cavalry. The fighting went on in the following way. Their rear guard was composed of lightly armed cohorts, and several of these would halt and make a stand where the ground was level. If the road lay uphill, then the ground was all in their favor, as those who had gone on ahead could, from their higher position, give cover to their comrades on the ascent. But when they had to cross a valley or go downhill, they were always in danger. Those in front were unable to be of any use to those delayed in the rear, and our cavalry from higher ground shot at them from behind. The only thing they could do in these conditions was to order the main body of their legions to halt, then charge altogether against our cavalry until they had driven it back, and then, with the cavalry out of the way, to start forward immediately at the double, cross the valley, and halt again on the higher ground at the other side. As for their own cavalry, of which they had a considerable force, it had been entirely demoralized by previous engagements, and was so far from being any use to them that they had to protect it themselves by keeping it in the center of their column. If any of their mounted detachments did venture to leave this protection, they were immediately rounded up by our own cavalry. This kind of fighting means slow, gradual progress, and frequent halts in order to support the rear guard. So it happened on this occasion, and after marching rather less than four miles, all the time under heavy attack from our cavalry, they occupied a high hill and dug themselves in. Their entrenchment was only on the side facing us, and they did not unload their baggage animals. When they saw that we had halted to camp, had put up our tents, and had sent out horsemen on foraging duty— they suddenly left their position at about noon on the same day and resumed their march, hoping that we would be delayed by the absence of our cavalry. I saw what was happening, and after giving the legions a short rest, set out in pursuit, leaving a few cohorts to guard the baggage. I ordered the foraging party to follow on at 4 p.m., and the cavalry to be recalled at once. Before long our cavalry was again operating as it had done day after day on the march. The fighting at the enemy's rear guard was very fierce, so much so that they were almost routed, and a number of their men, including some centurions, were killed. Meanwhile, our main body was pressing on and threatening their whole army. They were thus given no chance of looking for a suitable place to encamp, and, finding it impossible to advance farther, were forced to halt and pitch camp in a bad position with no water nearby. However, 
For the reasons already mentioned, I refrained from engaging them in battle. On this day I gave orders that the tents should not be pitched, so that we should all be able to follow without delay, whether the enemy tried to escape by day or by night. As it was, after discovering what a bad position they were in, they spent the whole night in building out additional fortifications, amounting to the construction of an entirely new camp. They went on with the work next morning, starting at dawn and continuing the whole day. But the more they worked and the farther they extended their camp, the farther they got from their water supply. By trying to make things better for themselves, they were in fact making things worse. At night, no one left camp to get water. Next day, leaving a small garrison to guard the camp, they led out their whole force to bring in water, but sent out no foraging parties. Personally, I preferred them to suffer in this way and so be compelled to surrender rather than to fight a pitched battle with them. However, I tried to blockade them completely by building a rampart and a trench around them, which, I hoped, would have the effect of checking any sudden attempts of theirs to break out. They would be forced, I imagined, to make attempts of this kind. And so, partly because they were without fodder, and partly because when they did make a sortie they wanted to be as little encumbered as possible, they had all their baggage animals destroyed. Two days were spent in planning and conducting these operations, and by the third day the lines which we had been building were almost finished. In order to prevent us from completing what was left to be done, the enemy gave the signal for action, led out their legions, and formed up in line of battle just outside their camp. I recalled my own legions from their work ordered all the cavalry to their stations, and formed a line facing them. My apparent reluctance to fight, which was not what my own men or the world in general expected of me, was in fact doing me considerable harm. However, I was still, for the reasons already mentioned, against joining battle, and particularly so now, because the space available for fighting was so narrow that even if the enemy were routed, this would not contribute much toward final victory. The two camps were less than six hundred yards apart from each other. Two-thirds of this space was filled by the two opposing armies, leaving only one-third in which there was room to advance and attack. In the event of a battle, the defeated side would be able to turn and reach safety quickly inside its camp. I therefore decided that although I would resist them if they attacked, I would not be the first to move into battle. Aphranius had drawn up his five legions in two lines, and formed a third line of reserves from the cohorts of his auxiliary troops. My army was drawn up in three lines. The first line was made up of four cohorts from each legion, and for the two other lines each legion supplied three cohorts. I kept the slingers and archers in the center, and placed the cavalry on the flanks. So, with both armies drawn up and ready, it appeared that each side was keeping to its original purpose. I was not going to join battle unless forced to do so, and Afranius simply aimed at stopping our works. Things remained in this condition until sunset, when both sides withdrew to camp. Next day we got ready to complete the fortifications on which we were occupied, and the enemy turned their attention to the ford over the Segre to see whether they could get across. When I saw what they were doing, I sent across the river some German light infantry and some of the cavalry, and had patrols posted at frequent intervals along the banks. The end had now come. They were shut in on every side. Their animals had been kept unfed for four days. They had no water, wood, or grain. So they begged for a conference, if possible a private one, out of hearing of the troops. This I refused, but agreed to confer with them in public, if they wished to do so. They gave me Aphranius's son as a hostage, and met me in a place chosen by myself. Aphranius then spoke, with both armies listening to his words. You must not, he said, be angry with us, or with our troops, for wanting to keep faith with our general, Nias Pompey. We feel, however, that we have now done our duty 
and that we have suffered enough punishment in the severe privation that we are enduring. We are now shut in like wild beasts, cut off from water, cut off from movement. Both our physical sufferings and the shame we feel in our minds are unendurable. We admit that we are beaten men, but we beg and pray that if there is any room left for mercy, you will not think it necessary to inflict on us the supreme penalty. He spoke in as humble, indeed, in as abject a way as it is possible to imagine. I replied as follows. Your complaints and your appeals for sympathy come worse from you than they could from anyone else. Everyone except you and your fellow commanders has acted well. I acted well when, with the best possible conditions of time and place on my side, I refused to fight a pitched battle, simply because I wanted the way to be absolutely clear for making peace. My troops acted well when they protected and preserved men of yours, whom they had in their power, although you had treated them disgracefully and had killed their comrades. Lastly, even the men of your own army behaved well. They tried to make peace of their own accord, thinking it right to avoid bloodshed among their own people. So men of all ranks have stood out for compassion. It was only the generals, you and Petraeus, who shrank from the idea of peace. You showed no respect for conferences. You disregarded the rights of a truce. You savagely put to death innocent men who were deceived into thinking that they were safe when peace talks were going on. And what has happened is what usually does happen when people show too much arrogance and obstinacy. You are changing your tune and begging most earnestly for the very thing which just now you were too proud to accept. However, it is not my intention to make use of your humiliations and my own strong position in order to increase my own fighting forces. All I ask is that those armies which you have maintained for so many years to be used against me should now be disbanded. It was certainly against me that they were directed. Nothing else would account for the sending of six legions to Spain, the raising of a seventh one on the spot, the fitting out of powerful fleets, and the choice of commanders of proved experience. None of these measures had anything to do with establishing order in Spain, or with any need felt by the Spanish provinces, which have enjoyed peace for such a long time that they require no help of this kind. No, it was against me that these forces were long ago mobilized and kept in readiness. It was against me that a new form of constitution was adopted, under which one man could govern Rome from outside the gates and at the same time could retain control for year after year of two warlike provinces without ever visiting them himself. It was against me that the laws concerning provincial governorships were changed, so that the men sent out to govern provinces were not as they always had been, ex-praetors or ex-consuls, but simply people who had been chosen and approved by a political clique. It was in order to injure me that veterans were not allowed to plead their age as an excuse, and have been called up to command armies after having completed their years of military service. In my case, and in mine alone, the time-honored tradition was disregarded by which all generals who had conducted successful wars were allowed to return to Rome and then disband their armies with honor, or with some distinction, or at least without dishonor. All these affronts I have borne patiently, and I shall continue to do so. Nor do I want now to take your army away from you and use it for myself, though I could easily do this. All I want is that you should not keep it for use against me. So, as I have said, what you must do is this. Leave the province and disband your army. This is all I ask, and these are the only terms on which you can have peace. These words of mine caused much joy and relief among the soldiers of Afrenius, as was evident from the way in which they behaved. They had expected, and they deserved, to suffer something. 
yet they now found themselves being rewarded with a free discharge. When various points were raised about the time and place where they should be disbanded, they all shouted and gesticulated from the rampart where they stood, indicating that they wanted to be discharged at once, and that whatever guarantees were given, they would not feel really safe if there were any further delays. And so, after a short discussion of the arguments on either side, it was decided that all those who were domiciled or had property in Spain should be discharged at once, and that the rest should receive their discharge at the River Var. I guarantee that they should receive no ill treatment on the way there, and that no one should be compelled to take the oath of loyalty to me unless he wanted to do so. I also promised to supply them with grain until they reached the River Var, and in addition provided that any property of theirs which, in the course of the war, had come into the hands of my soldiers should be given back to them. I paid over the correct sums of money after having had a fair valuation made. After this, whenever there were any disputes between the soldiers of the two armies, they would of their own accord refer them to me for decision. A mutiny almost took place when the enemy legions demanded their pay, and Petraeus and Afranius claimed that it was not yet due. There was a general demand that I look into the matter myself, and both parties were satisfied with my ruling. About a third of their army was disbanded in two days. I arranged that on the march two of my own legions should go ahead and the rest should follow in the rear, so that the camps should be quite close to each other. One of my staff officers, Quintus Fufius Calenus, was given the job of superintending the withdrawal. He followed out my instructions, and after making the journey from Spain to the river Var, the rest of Afrenius's army was disbanded.